The global push to reach net zero emissions by 2050 has been a ticking time bomb for the fossil fuel industry. But achieving that goal grew more complicated this year following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Countries ditched Russian energy as Western sanctions tried to damage Moscow's money machine. Europe felt the crunch given it relied heavily on the nation's gas. The region had to turn to other sources and other countries to power households and businesses. That pushed up global energy prices, adding another pain point to rising inflation worldwide. Governments are now re-evaluating their energy mix, putting more reliance on different sources and taking a fresh look at nuclear. They are also investing more in renewables to diversify while achieving emissions reduction targets. The aim is to be better prepared in case energy is once again used as a weapon. All right, for more, let's speak now with Brian Murphy, Head of Energy and Natural Resources of Asia Pacific of Bain & Company. He joins us from Perth. And Daniel Kamen, Professor of Energy at the University of California, Berkeley. He joins us from Hanoi this morning. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, uh, Brian, let me start with you first. The energy sector becoming increasingly complex due to geopolitics, security concerns, extreme weather. What are the most pressing challenges to this desired transition to clean energy at this point in time? Yes, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I think overall, the challenge from an energy transition point of view is we're moving from, we need to move from a commitments phase into a, into a delivery phase. And as we do that, we're going to face the reality of, of transition, the practicalities of transition. So whilst we need to definitely accelerate the trajectory of progress, uh, on the one hand, that's going to continue to require uh, really high degrees of alignment across companies, uh, across industries and across countries. On the other hand, as we just saw in the recap, you know, this is happening at a time where uh, you know, we expect energy transition to be happening in a more fragmented way, in a more volatile environment, effectively in a more disorderly way across the world. And at the same time, we're staring into some of the more pragmatic challenges uh, around scaling up some of the new energy solutions, like the availability of talent or building new supply chains. And at the same time, I, I think we're going to be staring into a closer coupling of the social aspects of energy transition, uh, like the impact for developing nations and, trust, uh, and just transition than we have in the past. So certainly some challenges ahead, but... Um, you know, they present opportunities for some as much as they do challenges. Professor, talk us through some of the implications of the rising cost of energy and what it means for energy transition. Well, there's, there's a range. Um, on the one hand, we have a renewable sector which is growing dramatically. Um, last year and the year before, renewables were 90% of new capacity. Recent reports came out indicating that that's going to continue, as I would expect. Um, the movement to electrified vehicles means making not only our transportation system smarter and more integrated in with our um, stationary system, but it also means we're going to need to dramatically make our grid smarter so that distributed clean energy mini grids um, can come online as well. And I think the real the challenge is one that Brian highlighted, and that is that we need to do this far faster. We have the technology in many parts of the world. Solar is now the least cost form of energy, but the subsidies that exist for fossil fuels are quite extreme. And this new important wrinkle, I'll call it more than a wrinkle, that is the just transition, doing this in a socially um, gender friendly, uh, friendly to minority groups way is a critical part of the story. And few governments have put in policies that really lock that in yet. So we have added challenges, but the, the greater job capacity in the clean energy economy, the need to move from a hydrocarbon based system to really a smart material system, those are actually more opportunities than challenges. We as a global society are just been very, very slow in taking up the mantle for the opportunities in this new energy economy. Uh, you talked about opportunities. I mean, we have seen more countries. We're looking at the viability of nuclear energy, Professor. I mean, should that trend sort of continue? Uh, are you concerned about any aspect of a more a widespread return to nuclear energy? 
Well, I guess as a professor of nuclear engineering, um, I'm very excited about the innovation space. There are small modular reactors. There's new advanced technologies available in a whole variety of fission, uranium, thorium, plutonium technologies. But nuclear has yet to demonstrate that it can meet the price point and to be a friendly partner for renewables. These are significant challenges. And of course, uh, last week we had the announcement of fusion uh, first being achieved terrestrially, which is certainly a long way from uh, from energy generation for power. But the nuclear proponents are very bullish on, on playing a large role, but there's some real re large barriers for traditional nuclear fission um, and a long timetable for nuclear fusion to become part of that mix. Brian, some countries will find it harder to transition to cleaner energy than others. Singapore, for example, has limited geography and conditions for sustainable sort of energy like wind farms or hydropower, for example. What should we be thinking about? Yeah, and, and I think particularly in Asia Pacific, we see quite a mixture of, of countries, don't, don't we? And it's helpful to think about a separation between the ability to transition and the willingness to transition. And I think on the willingness to transition, most countries have taken great leaps forward over the last couple of years. So the question becomes really about the the ability to, you know, we've got some countries with uh, very limited endowment of natural renewable resources. We've got some countries with quite limited endowment of hydrocarbon um, resources. And it's it's particularly complicated, I think, in the developing nation context. And uh, so I, I think, you know, in Asia Pac, we see quite a mix of those, those types of, of countries, Japan and Korea are at a very different point. Um, and could take a very different role in the trade mix going forward as a result. Um, Australia could take a very different role in the mix as a green energy exporter going forward. Uh, and we have countries like India, which could play a, a, a different and important role in supply chains going forward. But I think, you know, back to the point of we expect this to be a rather more fragmented um, energy transition than we've been planning for in, a, in the past. I think what we'll see as a result of what you're describing is we'll see uh, some of the more developed and endowed uh, countries move a little bit faster than we might have expected and some of the others move a little bit slower. I think what gives us overall confidence, though, is that I think that the medium to long-term direction of, of travel is clear. Uh, and again, where we see opportunities as well as challenges, you know, irrespective of where each country is starting at, uh, I think that can help catalyse the system progress as well. Mm. And Brian, uh, coming back to more traditional and dirtier forms of energy generation, we are expecting to see a coal consumption reach a new high this year, albeit in the, the marginal annual increase. What's your assessment on the net direction in the usage of coal in the next five to ten years? Yeah, we're seeing some some short term sort of reaction and response now at the moment, aren't we? Not just in coal, but also in gas and, and oil. Uh, and very understandably, we're seeing um, resilience of supply and uh, and cost of supply um, come much back to the fore. Uh, I think in the medium to longer term, though, uh, there is a clear direction of travel for, for thermal coal. Um, and I, I think what we're seeing in the current circumstances is uh, some momentum behind the longer term direction actually in the lower carbon energy space, uh, which decouples uh, the price of that energy from uh, uh, commodity fluctuations as well. So I think whilst we're seeing some, some short-term uh, reversion, if you like, on the demand front, I think the long-term direction of travel for coal in particular is clear. Mm. Uh, Professor, the European Union countries have agreed uh, to cap a uh, cap on gas prices. Uh, talk to us a bit about sort of the implications and you know the, the sort of politics that sort of gets drawn into uh, the energy discussions. Yeah, this is a tricky line because what the EU has tried to do is to cap the price high enough that Russia will still produce, but low enough that European leaders can claim or feel good uh, about the degree to which they're limiting profits for uh, Putin's uh, Putin's regime and the invasion and the funds to uh, support the invasion of the Ukraine. That's a bit of a delicate line and. I would certainly like to hope that this will be less about trying to, to, to manage the, the profits for Russia and much more about a signal, as Germany seemed to indicate, that they would put significant money into accelerating their transition off of not only Russian gas, but all gas. 
because ultimately for the climate equation, it doesn't matter where that fossil gas comes from. With the low cost of renewables, the higher job numbers in this space, there is a path to do it. But unfortunately, we've been moving fairly slowly in in, in taking these climate signals and these social justice signals into account. So the European dance is a bit complicated. Um, And again, I think that as the winter gets deeper and then as we emerge in the spring, exactly what form the resolution of the Ukraine crisis, be it negotiated or just continued battle and stalemate, is going to likely determine how that that pricing issue plays out. But I think that's a that's a near term issue, not part of the longer term equation where not only coal has to go away, but fossil gas has to go away as well. And that one's the more controversial because many countries are still exploring and finding new sources of fossil gas, not using this moment to transition to renewables. Thank you so much, uh, both of you gentlemen, for speaking with us uh, this morning and putting that in one context for us. Brian Murphy, Head of Energy and Natural Resources, Asia Pacific at Bain & Company, and Daniel uh, Kamen, Professor of Energy at the University of California, Berkeley.